that the chart that you have received is chart number six. Now, to keep from confusing you, you ended up with chart number 3B the last time. And you may say, well, shouldn't this be chart number 4? Well, I want to keep all of the charts in Daniel in the sequence. So, Daniel is chart 1, actually, through 5. And you say, well, where is 4 and 5? And why are we starting on 6th? Well, the reason for it is that later on in Revelation, we will bounce back into Daniel in order to get some keys to go further on in Revelation. And when we go back to Daniel, then we'll pick up chart 4 and chart 5. So this will help you, and so you will not be confused. We are now beginning in the book of the Revelation. And uh, the other material in Daniel will be keys that we can see. Revelation 1, chapter 1, that is, verse 1, and reading through to the first chapter, or verse 20, that is. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servant things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified, or literally signified, because that's what the word signified means, uh, by his angels unto his, by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. <coughs> Excuse me. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. <clears throat> I am Alpha and Omega, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother, and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and to Pergamos, and unto Tyratyra, Th Th and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice and that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, or literally lampstands. Lamp and in the midst of the seven Lamp stands, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about with the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as the flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining, or that shineth in his strength. 
And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels, and the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are seven churches. Well, we begin the first chapter of the book of the Revelation. I want you to notice, probably in your Bible it would say the Revelation of St. John at, at the heading of it. But that's of man, so you can discount that. Look in the very first verse, it says, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, not of John, but of Jesus Christ. The Greek word for revelation is apocalypsis. And it comes, it's a verb, really. It comes from a verb, apocalypto, which means to unveil. Apo, uh, apo, uh, it means away, and kaluma, a veil, which you put it together, you get revelation or taking away a veil so that we can see the re full revelation of Christ as to who he is and his revelation coming into his kingdom. And it also has to do with those events that pertains to and surround the second coming of Jesus Christ. And here, as we look closely, we see really the, the salutation of this book. Uh, first of all, God gave these things through his angel, and he gave it to show us things which must come to pass. And anyone who actually reads this book or hears it, God says there's a special blessing on you. I ask you this question this morning before we really get started. Do you want special blessings from God in your life? Then read the book of the Revelation often. And if you can't read, then have somebody read it to you because he says here, blessed are those who read or who hears. Now, I have heard the testimony of those who have taken God up on this and they would read the book of Revelation once a day. After a while they said they could read it in about a half hour after they read it uh, several times. And they just took God up on it and oh, they, their testimony was that God's blessings began to fall upon them in many different forms. Now, it's God's word, it's not mine. He said there's a blessing on it. And if you believe God's word, then take him up on it and see what he does in your life. You see, Satan doesn't want you to read it because he doesn't want you to see the end time thing, particularly where he himself is, is defeated totally and cast into the lake of fire. First into the bottomless pit and then the lake of fire. God tells uh, Daniel here, the time is at hand. He told Daniel, seal up the book for the time, till the time of the end. Here he tells John to seal out the book for the time is at hand. We know that these two books go together. We know that the symbolism of one is brought over to the other so that we can understand it. Here in this first verse God says that he sent it and signified it by his angel the word signified is the same word sanctified or he gives it by symbols 
Revelation is one of the most symbolic books of all the Bible. And you have to understand what the symbols mean to know what God is talking about. And yet, what it, whatever he, whenever he uses symbols, does it mean that the meaning is, is anything less than literal? It is literal. It's just that you understand it through symbols. Now, in this salutation, we see the title of the one who really wrote it. You see, John didn't really write this like he did his gospel. He didn't recall from memory, word for word, as the Holy Spirit enlightened him so that he could remember every word and write it down like he did uh, his gospel. It's a totally different style of writing. No, he was an amanuensis here. That means he was like a secretary. He wrote down things that he heard and things that he saw. It was literally Jesus Christ that was writing the book. So you might say the author is Jesus Christ personally. John was just co the one that was copying it down. Here we see the title of the one who wrote it. He's the one which is, which was, and which is to come. This shows that he is God himself. Now, you know, you can't separate. You cannot separate uh, the Trinity and say that there are three gods. No, there is one God. There is a Godhead. And God himself reveals himself in three personalities. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And here is God himself speaking. And he says, I'm the one which is, which was, and which is to come. He is saying, I really, he's saying, I am. I am God. He's, at the same time, this is God the Son, that is Jesus Christ. Also the seven spirits that are before the throne. Look there in verse 5. You see, it's from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and uh, is the from, is and is of the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That speaks of Jesus personally. Now, just above verse five, you see it also comes from the seven spirits which are before the throne. <clears throat> now you may ask that question, uh, is the Holy Spirit seven spirits or one spirit? He's one spirit, but manifested here in symbols as seven. Seven is a number for dispensational completeness, showing that God's work is through at this point. It's also speaks of Jesus Christ himself personally. Now over in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, we have verses, of, two, these two verses of Scripture that speaks of Christ in prophecy. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, David's father, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now he's talking about Christ. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. I want you to count them. There are seven spirits there. Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of wisdom, Spirit of understanding, Spirit of counsel, Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. <clears throat> As you go back to the tabernacle, if you remember, there is a lampstand made of beaten gold with seven lamps, which stands for the seven spirits. These same seven. <clears throat> Yet the lampstand itself stands for Jesus Christ, one who came and was beaten who was God and who is God, yet he was beaten and hung on a cross and he died for our sins. Thus, we have 
the seven spirits which are before his throne. And then to show us again the difference in the persons of the Godhead in verse 5, then he introduces Jesus Christ himself. He is the first begotten of the dead. That's prophet. He is prince of the kings. He's one of these days he will be king. Right now he's our high priest. And he was the one that washed our sins in his own blood. First of all, he purchased us with his own blood. He is continually washing us daily in his own blood to cleanse us from sins that occur in our life. And then he made us kings and priests under God. Now in the Greek, <clears throat> this is literally a kingdom of priests. First thing he did to each and every one of us when we were saved, he made us a priest. You, as a believer, you have that right as a priest. The priesthood of the believer. <clears throat> you can go to God and stand in in the presence of God for other people in your prayers. <clears throat> and you can go to people and stand in the presence of people for God. <clears throat> so we have what a priest does. And he has made a kingdom of priests. Later on he will be making some kings <laughs> as well as priests. And then we come... Down here to verse uh, 7. <clears throat> we get into the announcement. We leave the salutation, get into the announcement. Behold, he cometh with clouds, <clears throat> and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Well, Zechariah, I want you to turn there with me for a minute. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 13. Let's look at this prophecy through the eyes of the Old Testament prophet hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. Beginning in verse 6. This is at his second coming now, folks. Zechariah recording here in verse 6 of chapter 13. And one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? <clears throat> then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. <clears throat> that speaks of his own people that put him on the cross. Verse 7 helps bear this out. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. That's Jesus. And against that man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. Now within that statement, you have the shepherd being smitten on the cross. And you have the sheep scattered throughout all the nations of the world where they have been for 2,000 years. <clears throat> the reason that God calls them the sheep is because they are the remnant that will be saved. They'll be scattered. And then he says, And I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. That's the remnant. All the Jewish people that put him on the cross, that turned their back upon him, that, that uh, killed the shepherd that hung him on the cross, and then was scattered throughout the world. God says, I'll turn mine hand upon the little ones, or the remnant, when he comes back, and they'll be saved. Now, how will that happen? Verse 8. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. <clears throat> you know, my heart goes out for the Jewish people. They suffered a great holocaust in Nazi Germany. Six million Jews died. A holocaust. They're doing everything they can now in their in their politics in Israel to keep from this happening ever again. And yet the Lord says the day is coming when two-thirds of the world's Jewry will be killed 
cut off and only one third will be saved. And that's during the last half of the great tribulation period under Antichrist and his gathering together there the nations of the world when they attacked Jerusalem. Two thirds, a holocaust far beyond the six million Jews of Germany. And then he says in verse 9, and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. And they shall call upon my name and I'll hear them. I will say it is my people and they, shall, they will say the Lord is my God. Now, beloved, there is a furnace. <clears throat> there is a furnace here upon the earth of fire in which they must come through called the furnace of affliction. There is a furnace of fire in the heavenlies for us at the judgment seat of Christ to purify us too. Furnace is always spoken of as a place of purification, never destruction. Here they're purified, according to Zechariah. At the fire before the judgment seat of Christ is where we're purified, where all of the dross and that is the old works, the old dead works of the old nature that we've produced shall be burned up. And then rewards will be handed out. And suffering of loss also many will suffer. For they will gain no, re they will gain no reward. But the re those that have the rewards that are handed out will go into the kingdom to rule and reign with our Lord. Now Zechariah gives us the details of this. Here in the book of the Revelation, as we uh, look here in this verse, verse 7, let me get my place. You have those at first that pierced him, then you have all the kindreds of the earth wailing because of him. <coughs> Luke gives us another look at this. Turn with me to Luke chapter 22 for a minute. Luke chapter 22, verse 25. Here's the coming of the Lord. Here's the whole rest of the world. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Now that's symbolism again, folks. Sea is always people. Distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Great confusion and great perplexity among the peoples of the world at that time. <clears throat> In verse 26, men's hearts failing them for fear. And for looking for those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to pass, then look up. Lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Now he's talking here to those on the earth that belong to God, the remnant. The Jews. We're already in heaven. The churches I've already gone up seven years before in the rapture. <clears throat> but notice men's hearts failing them. I've heard of men's hearts failing. I've heard of people dying from, from fear. Being literally frightened to death. I've never seen it, but I've heard of it. Here it's going to be all over the world. People's hearts failing them for fear. And so, Jesus here says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Verse 8 in our text. That's his title. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, shows that he is God. Number one. Number two, that he is God's word. Alpha and Omega is the first letter of the Greek and the last letter of the Greek. Alpha first letter, omega, last letter, 
Everything that God would ever talk to us or tell us or speak to us at, uh, is in the Bible and it's written in His Word and it's written with the Greek language. I am Alpha and Omega, the Word of God. And at the same time, I am the first and the last. I am God. <clears throat> now we come to the vision. The vision actually begins in verse 9. So let's go back to our text. Verse 9. Here we see that John was in the Isle of Patmos. Patmos is a little island about 90 miles off the the Western Asian Minor coast, between Asia Minor and Greece, but it's about 90 miles off of the coast of Asia Minor. And some people say that he was uh, exiled there by the Roman Emperor Domitian. The Bible is not very clear on that. He just says he was there. He had been the pastor at Ephesus for many years. And this occurs near the end of the <clears throat> first century. And this is the vision that he had. And you remember when Jesus was upon the earth, he says, there will be some standing here which shall not die until they see me coming with power and glory. Well, we know they saw that in the transfiguration. But John, the one out of the three, is going to literally see him being transported literally into the future where he sees with his very eyes and writes down these things. The vision. All right, he sees the tribulation coming. He sees the millennial kingdom. <clears throat> and so he's carried away in the spirit there on that Isle of Patmos. Now, beginning here in verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. <clears throat> Stop there. We have a lot of people think, well, the Lord's day is Sunday, so he was in Patmos on Sunday. No, the Lord's day is not Sunday in here in the Bible. That was something that was invented by men later on when they went to church. No, the Lord's day means the same as the day of the Lord. He was carried, you see, forward in time to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the day of the Lord. It begins when the wrath of God begins to fall upon the earth. It goes through to his second coming. It goes through all the way through the millennium, and it even goes to the time when God destroys his earth. We figure that to be, according to Scripture, about the 31st century that is yet to come. The day of the Lord. So John was there, and he saw these things, and he heard, the first thing he heard was a great voice that said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book, and send it to seven churches. Later on, we're going to find that these seven churches include you and include me, and includes this church. For it not only means seven literal churches, it means seven typical churches, and it means seven church periods of time. <clears throat> and he turned and he saw seven golden candlesticks, literally lampstands, lampstands. Candles weren't invented until about the 16th century. And so when the Bible was translated, they used the word candlestick. No lamp stands, like little gravy bowls on a lamp. And they had, uh, they had olive oil in them and a wick. And there was, there was seven generally to a stand. And here you see seven of them. And then in the midst of them, one like a son of man. And this son of man, of course, is Jesus Christ, literally talking to John. And he had a garment all the way down to the foot. And he had a girdle around his chest, a golden girdle, which stands for kingship. Priesthood, if he was still in his office of high priest, this, there would be a sash around the middle part. But this is a girdle around the chest, showing it was a day when he's in his kingship, at his coming. And his head was as white as wool, verse 14. This is nothing but a symbol, folks that says that he is God Almighty. 
white hair in Daniel, as we saw once before, and in Revelation, points to the fact that God is ageless. There is no time in which He began. He's always been. And thus He is taken upon the title in Daniel because He wears the white hair as symbol, the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days. And there in Daniel He sits as a judge. And here He is a judge. And did you know that in England that they picked this up many, many years ago and all the barristers and all the judges in England wears white wigs in court. It comes from this uh, place in the Bible, the white wool hair, the ancient of days, showing that he is not only Jesus Christ, but he is God Almighty himself. He has always been and always will be. And he had eyes as a flame of fire. There was an artist once that tried to paint this picture, and it, just, it was grotesque. Flames of fire coming out. And in the next verse, he has a sword coming out of his mouth. All symbolic, folks. The eyes as a flame of fire shows that he is coming back in, 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 in judgment. I think of the first time when he was here, eyes that had tears in them for his people and for those who turned their back upon him. But when he comes back the second time, eyes as a flame of fire. He comes back as the warrior. And he has feet like fine brass, like burning in a furnace. Brass in the scriptures is always a symbol of judgment. Brass, judgment. And here we see he's going to judge the world and the nations with defeat. As we read over in the Old Testament, he's going to tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. The feet speaks of judgment. The brass feet speaks of judgment. He comes in judgment. And he has out of his mouth a sharp two-edged sword. This is not the word of God you see the sword uh, that sword is the sword of the spirit but this is a different sword this is a sword of justice and the scripture says his countenance was as the sun shining in its strength in Malachi that prophet speaks of the second coming when he comes and he calls him the son of righteousness. Of course, we see that shining of him on Mount Transfiguration. There, when, when we look at him in that transfiguration, he was shining. Here he's shining as the sun. Can you imagine? The sun in its brightness. Looking at a sun in a full day could put your eyes out. Our Lord is coming with this kind of glory when he, when he literally comes to earth to, to set up his kingdom. In John, in verse 17, he just fell down at his feet as dead, as a dead man. If you go over to Daniel, Daniel got a glimpse of him and he fell down at his feet. He fainted away. It seems like one cannot be in the presence of deity without falling down as a dead man. Now he didn't die for he touched his, his shoulder and told him to fear not. I think, I think of the time when Jesus was in the boat and uh, they recognized who he was and uh, they fell down before him and said, depart from me. I think this was Peter and says, I'm a man of iniquity. So in the presence of deity, this, what, this is what happens in this kind of a body. He fell down as a dead man, and he laid, Jesus laid his right hand on him. And he said, fear not. Fear not. Then he again identified himself in verse, in verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Oh, how I love that statement. I am alive forevermore. 
And anyone who trusts Him will be alive forevermore, forever and ever and ever and ever. And after a hundred million ages have rolled by, we haven't even got to the morning part of eternity. I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Oh, beloved, our Lord and our Savior has on His belt side the keys of, of hell. We talk about Hades, Sheol, and uh, where it is. He says, uh, the bars that keep people in, he says, I got the keys to them. He says, I got the keys also to death. Death and to hell. All right. We see here of Jesus, we see this figure of Jesus, and he says to John, don't have any fear. And then we finally come to the key, verse 19, which makes up your chart, the key to the division of the book of the Revelation. And he says to him, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The entire book of the Revelation is in three divisions. On your chart, I've had them drawn out for you. Revelation 1, 10 through 20. The things which thou hast seen. What did he see? He saw Jesus. He saw the seven golden candlesticks. He saw the seven stars in his hand. He saw Jesus Christ coming in all his glory. The things which thou hast seen. That's past. That happened in the Isle of Patmos. Even though he was brought forward in the future. That's what he saw. And then Revelation 2, verse 1 through Revelation 3, 22, are the things which are. The things which are. We're living in this particular area of the Bible. We're living in the things which are. We're living at the last end of the Laodicean church period. On your chart there. This stands for the last 2,000 years of church period. Church history. And the next great thing is the rapture of the church. And then after the rapture of the church, we enter into the third division called the things which shall be hereafter. Now all of these are revealed in the book of the Revelation. So, you need to mark verse 19 as your key to the book as far as division goes. And now we come to verse 20, which is the interpretation. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest are the seven churches. Our Lord is simply saying that all the churches is divided into seven kinds of churches, seven periods of churches, and he's in their midst. He's in their midst, and he's still in their midst, and we're going to see that these Lampstands or candlesticks, as it's written in the King James, stands for your witness out to the world. The light, the wick, the oil. The oil is the Holy Spirit in our lives. The wick is our life being burned away. And the light is our witness. And every church ought to have that witness. If they don't, they're liable to lose their position in that group of seven and the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The word angelos, the word angel here means messenger. Messenger. I don't believe he's talking about each church literally have an angel over it. I think he's speaking about the pastors of the churches, the messengers to the churches, and they are in his hand, beloved. <clears throat> They're in his hand. And... If they do right, no man, no man can harm them. If they preach the word, no man can harm them. 
But if they do bad and they fall away from God, nobody can help them either. You know, I think that's a good illustration of being in his right hand, meaning he has control of the pastor's life, the Bible teacher's life, the one he has sent to preach the gospel. And if you're doing it right, if you're doing what according to his will, you don't have to be afraid of anything. <clears throat> but if you've fallen away from him and uh, you're a, really a called pastor, maybe you've apostatized and fallen away and tried to maybe make money out of your ministry or whatever else, then you have a lot to fear because you're in the right hand of God when that day comes. Now to those who have never...